What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Three and Out YouTube page. I'm John Middlecoff, and we are talking football all day, every day. Make sure you subscribe, like the video, share it with your friends. Let's roll, baby. What is going on? Happy summer. Uh, we got a lot going on in the NFL world. Aaron Rodgers says, peace out to mandatory minicamp. But I don't even think it's close to the biggest issue with the Jets. Mike Tomlin is going to be the Pittsburgh Steelers coach probably till I die. Uh, signs a three-year contract extension and uh, RIP Jerry West. And he represents a small percentage of guys. And we've seen this in the NFL of people I admire greatly that get into the executive field. So we'll, we'll dive into some of that and a couple other NFL stories that are floating out there. Uh, but before we dive in, if you want to get outside, get some sun, go to a baseball game, watch the Yankees, watch the Dodgers, watch a concert. You want to go see some live music. I've gone to more events in the last two years working with Game Time, the official ticketing app of this podcast, than I probably had in the previous five. I still let my hair down, even though I don't have any, and take my lovely lady, or I got my brother tickets for Christmas, and... It's because this is by far the easiest ticketing app I've ever used. Uh, the ability to search by artist, by team, by venue, the price points, the sight lines, they have it all. So if you want to do something fun this summer, you should. Enjoy yourself. Go have a few brewskis. Go outside. Go to a concert. Have a fun time. Do it on me. Because take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app. Create an account and use the code JOHN. For $20 off. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem the code J-O-H-N for $20 off. Download the Game Time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices guaranteed. It's no disputing that Aaron Rodgers has entered kind of this part of his career where anything he does, anything he says, becomes an immediate headline and... For people in the word business, that <laughs> they love the clicks. For us talking about it, he's just an interesting figure. And he's done a lot of things that I have found head-scratching, right? Like demanding a trade from the Green Bay Packers to the New York Jets. Thought it was nuts. Now, I'm not anti-Ayahuasca. Never tried it. But a lot of people, you know, made him go, what's he doing? The Darkness Retreat. All four... Self-growth, trying to improve, but let's face it, most of us couldn't go and do a darkness retreat for three or four days. So he has just done things in the last couple of years that has already added to a guy that I would say was pretty polarizing before that. And the story about Aaron Rodgers leaving mandatory minicamp immediately just becomes a massive story. And personally, I don't think it's a big deal at all. I have no clue at this point in time of recording this where he went. I truly don't care. And you'd go, Middlecock, you're a hypocrite. You crush Lamar Jackson for not showing up. Well, yeah, Aaron Rodgers has been with the team, just like Patrick Mahomes, just like Justin Herbert, just like Josh Allen, all the star quarterbacks for the last two months. And he took off for a couple days in June, whatever. This is a business. He's going to get fined. There are repercussions for his actions, and he didn't care. If he hadn't been there all of OTAs and then also did this, I'd be like, yeah, this is fucking nuts. What's he doing? But he has been there the entire time, just like last season, the entire offseason. It has not been an issue. Did he go to another darkness retreat or to a uh, RFK speaking engagement? I got no clue. And like I said, I don't care. If you're going to miss a couple days in the offseason, it's not that weird. Players do it all the time. Where it gets weird is when you give Lamar Jackson a couple hundred million dollars and he doesn't show up until it's mandatory. Like, that, that's not ideal. It doesn't mean it's going to impact the fall. It's just not what the team wants. Now, the Ravens are well run. Big picture, they're going to be fine. This is the Jets. And they have constant issues. Today, on the back of the tabloids, I guess New York's one of the, the lone big cities where newspapers still matter, and he's everywhere, and it's gone viral, and everyone's making fun of him. And he brought it upon himself because he made the statement 
where football has to become the main thing. We can't worry about all that. And then he just disappears. But ultimately, like, he's been there the entire time. It's not an excused absence because you, you can't have an excused absence unless something personally bad is happening to you during mandatory minicamp. To me, the Jets' way bigger issue, like they know Aaron Rodgers, where he stands, where he's going to be during training camp, it's not a big deal. I think the overreaction's kind of laughable. But he's Aaron Rodgers. It's kind of like LeBron James. When anything happens, it becomes a really big deal. Hell, Caitlin Clark has thrown her hat into this ring. Caitlin Clark could, you know, eat a sandwich weird and we'd be like, what is going on with that? And that's Aaron Rodgers' world that we live in for as long as he plays in the NFL. Literally everything he does, people are going to have an opinion, which is part of the reason the NFL is so big. You, you need athletes that move the needle like this individual moves the needle. But he is the least of the Jets' worries. I said this the other day. They literally traded for a player who wanted a new contract. That's why he was having issues with the Eagles. He wants more money. So if you trade for that player and you do nothing with the contract, you are inheriting the problem. Right? When the Miami Dolphins traded for Tyreek Hill, the Chiefs had an issue because Tyreek wanted a ton of money and they weren't going to pay him. So when they traded him, if Miami had not reworked his contract and given him a huge contract extension, they would have also had an issue on their hands. But what did they do? They gave him a massive extension. The Raiders, Khalil Mack was not showing up to training camp until he got $85, $90 million guaranteed. Then the Bears trade a couple ones, a three, whatever for him. If they did not give him the contract extension, they would have inherited the problem. But they gave him a contract extension. The Jets trade for Hassan Reddick, who has not stepped foot in their building. Their coaching staff, their front office, do not know the player. They do not know the guy. And they have not given him a new contract, and he's MIA. That, to me, is the Jets' issue. Because it's symbolic of, do you guys know what you're doing? Aaron Rodgers can do things that you think are weird or you don't agree with. One thing that is not disputable is when he's on the field, he's a good player. And we know he's going to be on the field if his Achilles or body is together. Is Hassan Reddick ever going to show up? Is he ever going to come? Do they ever plan on giving him a contract extension? Or did they just trade for a player not realizing the severity of the issue? Did Howie Roseman just completely fleece them? If Aaron Rodgers is bad this season, there is no debate that the Packers fleeced the Jets on Aaron Rodgers. But we all universally agree. That if we were in Joe Douglas's seat, if we were Woody Johnson or John, Woody's brother who was running it at the time, maybe he wasn't, maybe Woody was already back, that we all would have made that trade. Every single one of us. And they, hell, Aaron Rodgers took a contract discount, gave them back like $30 million. He's actually been pretty easy for them to deal with. The only issue was his Achilles ripped five plays into a season in 2023. This Hassan Reddick issue is a problem. It's one thing when you have players that you've drafted on your own team that have contract issues. Brandon Ayuk, contract issue right now. You know him. Like, you know what he stands for. He knows you. Like, everyone's on the same page. It's about money, but you, you feel very comfortable with the guy. Why? Because you've spent years around them. The Jets haven't spent any time around this player. And let's face it, they traded for him because they kind of need him. Because they just lost one of their better pass rushers to the Eagles. So they replaced him with the Eagles' problem. And now it's become their problem because they clearly refuse to give him a contract. So Aaron Rodgers is going to get the headlines, but I promise you he's the least of their worries. We're this close to crowning an NBA champ. And with the action heating up on the court, it's even hotter at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. And DraftKings Sportsbook has you covered every step of the way with same game parlays, live betting, odds boosts, and so much more. Don't miss out as the NBA postseason winds down. It's super easy to just get started with DraftKings if you're a first timer. Try betting on something like a team to win. Go to DraftKings Sportsbook app, select your team, and place your first bet. It's that simple. 
And if you're new to DraftKings, you got to check this out. New customers bet 5 bucks to get 150 in bonus bets instantly. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use the code JOHN. That's code J-O-H-N for new customers. Get 150 in bonus bets when you bet just 5 bucks. Only on DraftKings. The crown is yours. The Steelers. Let me just say this. I do agree with consistency, knowing what you're going to get, and every day showing up is a huge advantage in life. That every day that you show up to work, that you know so-and-so is going to be there. Don't Isn't the old adage, showing up is half the battle? And I agree with that. If you are just willing to persevere and show up to your job or whatever you're doing on a daily basis, during the good times, during the bad times, you will slowly lap people in your field. Because most people eventually tap out or can't be consistent. Or just like, I'm going to take this month off. I don't have it right now. And the Steelers really, really value consistency and continuity. There is no arguing that. They've had three coaches for the last like 50 years. That means a lot to the Rooney family. We knew that before they ever signed Mike Tomlin to this three-year contract extension. And I don't believe that you just have to change to change. The NFL is not the tech industry. You don't just need to adapt nonstop just because you, that's just the landscape of the world and the business you're in. Though, clearly, you have to adapt schemes and change with players. But when you have something good as a coach, I understand not willing to make a change in that position. And no organization in the history of sports is less willing to upset the apple card in terms of their head coaching position than the Rooney family. But I think we have to acknowledge this in 2024. Mike Tomlin's a good coach. I said it last year. I, I thought they should have parted ways. It wasn't because I think Mike Tomlin sucks or Mike Tomlin immediately wouldn't have gotten a job. The Eagles once fired Andy Reid. They knew Andy Reid was good. Andy knew he was good. It was time for a change. Now, it was easier to do that because I think he had just won a four or five games. The Steelers don't bottom out. Mike Tomlin just refuses to lose less than eight games. Every year for the last basically six, seven years, nine, ten wins. But you know you're going to be one and done in the playoffs. And I think the Roonies are acknowledging we're cool with that. We want no part of ever being what the New York Giants have become or what Carolina was last year. We don't want to be in that business. We're fine with making boatloads of money, which the Steelers clearly are, continuing to being a major brand in the NFL, playing on primetime games, winning our nine games, our 10 games, and packing up after the first game in the playoffs. Because that's what this franchise is right now. And that's what I expect this season to happen again. And I'm not going to talk anymore as, you know, this season plays out like I expected to, like it has previously, consistently over the last six plus years, any differently than I have. I, I'm not going to say this is the time that it's time for a change because they're not going to change. As long as he wins, now if he wins five games, yeah, then maybe it would be on the table. But if he goes nine and eight or he goes 10 and seven and he's a wild card team, and he loses the Bills, or he loses the Chiefs, or he loses it ever in the first round, he will come back next year. And as long as he continues to do that, he will keep a job. And I think sometimes, and I, I just can speak from experience, I, I would imagine many people listening can as well, you don't need to be a head coach to know that whether it's force change or whether you do it yourself with a new job opportunity can be very... I would say self-motivating, self-correcting, invigorating. It creates a feeling inside that you cannot get when you're just stuck in the hamster wheel of your current role. And I'm not acting like Mike Tomlin is just content that he's not trying to win. Of course he is. Does he want to win the Super Bowl sitting at his desk right now? 100%. Does he have any chance to do that? No. Do the Roonies know that 100%. But they are just terrified to fire Tomlin 
or trade him to another team or whatever, and then get into a position where they just stink for a couple of years. They just refuse to do that. But when you refuse to do that, you also refuse to kind of take the next bigger step. Think about this. The Eagles, when they fired Andy and went to Chip and then went to Doug, they, they essentially took a step back to then eventually win the Super Bowl in 2017. No one would say that Doug Peterson is a better coach than Andy Reid. But, like, they just needed some new blood. They needed some new thoughts. And they didn't change their philosophical belief on how to build the team. They do it the same like Andy does. Build in the trenches. Quarterback play. I mean, it's pretty simple formula. So the Rooney way to build the team, old school, badass, tough guys, defense, run the ball, doesn't necessarily have to change. And it won't change. But this head coaching job feels like he's on scholarship a little bit. And he's definitely earned success. He does not lose. And there's something to be said in a league full of parity where basically everyone has some down years. John Harbaugh had some down years. John Harbaugh has had worse individual seasons than Mike Tomlin. But clearly his high end is much higher. So if I'm a Steeler fan, I guess on the glass half full, we're going to be competitive. And the glass half empty, we're just going to be doing what we've been doing, which is not that much when it matters the most. And that kind of sucks. Uh, Jerry West. Uh, when I was in radio, he, he passed away today. I used to go to a lot of Warrior games. And this is before Durant. So I went to the two teams, the one that won the championship and then the 73 win team that lost in game seven. And back then, they weren't quite the rock stars in which they would become when Kevin Durant went there. So you could go to a game, and pregame, Clay was not Clay. You could just, like, talk to him on the bench, you know, as he's just warming up or lacing his sneakers. This is, you know, a couple hours before the game. And Jerry West would be kind of roaming around a lot because he was, you know, a, a high-ranking official with them. He wasn't technically the GM Bob Myers was, but he had a lot of juice. And he was a major presence there. And I, I got to bullshit with him a couple times. N nothing too crazy. Wouldn't know my name or anything. And one thing I always remember is he's huge. Uh, he's massive. So I, I, I was offended when J.J. Redick made the comment about the, you know, the players back in his day. And, and, and Jerry West was clearly offended as well. Because Jerry West, if he played in 2024, would fucking dominate. He, he would have been fine. But I can't speak to his playing career. It was before I was ever born. Something I admire a lot in just human beings are deal makers, guys that essentially just get things done. Because let's face it, in the world we live in in America, in our society, we got winners and we got losers. And I actually think the thing that differentiates the two is not a huge gap. Some people are just unwilling to not figure it out. And whether you're in a normal business or whether you're in sports, that separates people. And when I look at Jerry West, I just see a guy who had gut feelings on things, who had an intuition because of his knowledge of basketball and just stuck to his guns. And when he wanted something, he just made sure it happened. And this goes back to when I was a kid, when he signed Shaquille O'Neal from the Orlando Magic, which was an enormous coup for the Lakers back then and was one of the bigger stories in the 90s. And then when he pounded the table for Kobe Bryant, but the thing I remember most being around these the Warrior teams for a couple years was, people forget this now, but and if you didn't live in the Bay Area, you might not know this, one huge potential trade for the Warriors was they were going to trade for Kevin Love. But the trade was essentially going to be Clay Thompson and someone else for Kevin Love. And Jerry West looked at Bob Myers and most importantly looked at Joe Lacob, the owner, and said, if you trade Clay Thompson, I quit. I resign immediately. And, and I just think people that trust their gut, and obviously it's built through experience of having success and making your decisions. Like Jerry West had balls. He had stones. He, he's, he's a dying breed of human being. I mean, the guy was born in 1938, so he, he grew up in a completely different time than several generations. But I've always respected elite players 
that then go on to become general managers. Because that job, unlike coaching, and he was a coach really briefly, I think in the late 70s, you don't have that much impact when the game starts. Right? There are some famous stories of Billy Bean, the longtime GM for the A's, of like, he'd work out during the games because he'd get his anxiety would be so high. Jerry West was notorious for that too. He would like get in his car and drive around Los Angeles because he couldn't watch. And again, he was the GM of the Showtime Lakers and the Kobe and Shaq, Phil Jackson Lakers. But his anxiety was so high, it struggled to watch because as a player, you're used to controlling. Even as a coach, you get to impact it. As a GM in basketball or football, you're sitting there on a suit in the stands eating popcorn. You have no impact when the game starts. And I think we have a lot of guys in the NFL. Obviously, Ozzie Newsome transitioned in the 90s and went on to become one of the greatest general managers the NFL has ever seen. And still to this day, he retired a couple years ago. At the head of the table is not the owner and is not the current GM, Eric DaCosta. It's still Ozzie. Why? He's addicted to football. John Elway, who played later than Ozzy, obviously made more money than Ozzy, and had successful business career, owned a bunch of car dealerships, did not need the money. And Pat Bowling called him up, and he said, I'll, I'll run the team. I'll fix this. And like Jerry West, the first thing he did was close a deal. Got rid of T Tim Tebow and landed Peyton Manning, and it changed the Broncos for four years. And they became one of, if on a given year, the best team in football. Went to two Super Bowls, had had a couple bad playoff losses, and obviously won the one in Peyton Manning's last year against the Carolina Panthers. And on a little bit lesser of a level, uh, I, I wouldn't put John Lynch on the level of John Elway, but John Lynch does not need to be doing this. He does not need to be working 80, 90-hour weeks. Having the anxiety overcome you on a Sunday when you're in a box eating a hot dog, watching the football game, and having no juice. But this is who they are, deep in their core, deep in their soul. They like being in the trenches. I was in the trenches for a couple of years. It was a lot. It's very stressful. And some guys thrive in that environment. Some guys enjoy just like you're not guaranteed to win every week. You're not guaranteed to win ever. It can be a disaster on any given season if the wrong guy gets injured. But they fucking love it. And it's a small percentage of people. Like Peyton Manning and Tom Brady, like they're not doing that. Because there's a big difference of like, one day I want to own the team. And no, I want to be the GM of the team. I want to be every day with the coaches and the players. And obviously Jerry is probably one of the most legendary executives in the history of sports. Ozzie Newsom is, I would say, for on the NFL level, you know, probably not far behind him. And what John Elway did forever in Denver, it ended poorly, but I respect the shit out of him for doing that. And same thing with John Lynch. Howie Roseman has to be the GM. This was his desired occupation. John Schneider, this is what these guys wanted to do in their 20s and 30s. Those guys were playing at a Hall of Fame level. And then as they got older, they missed it so much. Deep down in their loins, they had to get back and be a part of it. And be a part of the grind. Because it's really the highs and lows are dictated by the Sunday outcomes or in the NBA, you know, the playoff games. But it's really about the daily just ability to be I don't know, in the mud with the boys. And as we move on and the guys continue to make more and more historic amounts of money, I I think we're going to see less and less of these people doing it because like, who needs that stress in their life? Who does? Not many people when you got money. Why would you want stress in your life if you can avoid it? But some guys, that stress and that uncertainty and ultimately the competition gets them off because the money, I mean, Jerry West has been super rich for a long time. John Lynch was rich before he ever came back to the 49ers. John Elway was probably worth a hundred million dollars when he accepted to be the GM 
of the Denver Broncos. They did not need those jobs. Did not need them at all. Ryan Gudikins needs the job. Who, where else is he going to make three, four million dollars? I mean, this is this is his occupation. This was not these guys' occupation, but the sport was, and, and they loved it at the deepest levels. And I've said it forever. Having been around Pat Hill and Andy Reid, and knowing a bunch of guys that work for the Patriots forever uh, with Belichick, I, I don't think the common fan quite understands the addiction these men have to the sport of football how much it truly means to them, 24-7, 365. Thinking about it nonstop. It's their life. It's it's equal with their family. Sounds crazy, but I just promise you it is. And RIP Jerry West, probably one of the greatest sportsmen to ever live. And um, I'm a sucker when former great players get involved because I just think we're going to see less and less of that like I said, given the financial amounts of money these guys have made. A couple other quick stories before we get out of here. Uh, Darren Waller retired. He's going to become a rapper. I watched some of his rap song about getting a divorce with uh, Kelsey, the girl in the WNBA. It was probably one of the worst songs I've ever seen. Uh, was a pretty incredible story when Gruden and Mayock resurrected him. Uh, clearly a really, really talented player. Ever since he started wanting money, he started getting injured a lot, and he just kind of became irrelevant. And the Giants traded a third-round pick for him last year. He got injured, and, and now his career's over. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's just the, the NFL things happen fast. And then Amari Cooper, uh, he's currently holding out, wants a new contract in the last year of his deal, making $23 million, probably wants $30 million. And... Uh, all these wide receivers, man, it's tough because you're having success. Like, I only make 18, 19, 20 million dollars. These guys make it 28, 30, 34. And you're going to see this more and more over the next couple of years. These guys that are already on contract extensions going, hey guys, uh, I'm going to need a little race. And Amari Cooper's the latest. It'd be interesting to see how he's been good for the Browns. He's had a, it's weird, right? He was drafted number four overall. And the expectations, I mean, at one point, I remember going to Raiders camp his rookie year. I'm like, is this guy going to be the next Jerry Rice? In a weird way, it feels like he's underachieved, but also been a fantastic player. Uh, kind of a bizarre career, partly because the Raiders traded him, then the Cowboys traded him. But when you look at his stats, dude has been good for a long, long time. And I think... You could argue the Browns are in somewhat of a tight spot. You just give them one of those little three, four million dollar contract kickers to make it worth a little more. We'll see how that plays out. 